are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is a survival one about Steve Carter, who found himself on a missing persons list. Now, a baby went missing, and for 30 years, no one knew what happened to him until he solved the case himself. A survival story that no one expected, yet it unraveled even more of a mystery. By the way, I post so much content like this. It is my absolute passion to tell these stories, and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if it's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you're subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up, and leaving a nice comment down below. I also want to thank today's sponsor, which is Small Town Murders. It is an amazing app from the makers of Angry Birds with 2 million players already, but Small Town Murders is basically a crime mystery post puzzle match three game and it is so so exciting to play you basically become investigators and you complete puzzles to get more information more evidence and to narrow down your suspect list you'll actually get to interrogate the list of suspects to see which one matches the profile the best and you do this while traveling to different locations it's also free to play and if you use my link in the description box below you will get five free in-game boosts boosters to start out your journey on this game. If you've always wanted to put your detective skills to the test and solve some murder mysteries that of course aren't real but make it seem like it's real then this is just the game for you. And if you want to try it out like I said just click the link in my description box down below and you get five free in-game boosters to start you out. So thank you so much to Small Town Murders for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now let's get back to the story. So it's 2011 in Philadelphia, and Stephen Carter was a 34-year-old man who was working as a medical software company salesman, and he had a lovely, gorgeous wife named Tracy, and they were getting ready to start their own family. They were very happy together, and it was just an overall really good life, but before they did that, Steve wanted to learn a little bit more about his own family. You see, Steve knew that he was adopted from a young age, but his parents never told him much about his past and who his real biological family was. Now, he knew that he had come from an orphanage in Hawaii, and he had a biological mother named Jane Amai, and his biological father was unnamed but thought to be a Hawaiian native. He had bounced around from foster home to foster home during the first three years of his life and ended up in this orphanage where he was awaiting to hopefully be adopted in the future. But he wasn't going by Steve back then. When his biological mother had dropped him off, she had named him Tenzin Amai. And so investigators, when they realized what this name was and that this boy was now in state custody, they began to search for any living relatives that would possibly want to take him in so he wouldn't just be a ward of the state. However, they quickly realized this was a fake name because they could lead back to no relatives and they could not find anyone that could take this baby. Tenzin quickly became a ward of the state and ended up living in an orphanage with many others. They never knew his real name or if his mother's real name was that either. They had no idea where his biological mother had gone and so that's where he stayed. And then he was four years old and this is when he would be adopted. This was in 1980 and that's when a man named Steve Carter Sr. was stationed in Hawaii as a U.S. Army officer. Now he had a wife named Pat and they were both there in Hawaii and they began to talk about possibly adopting a child and they wanted to go ahead and do it while they were in Hawaii. So they began to look at different orphanages and that is when they landed on the orphanage with Tenzin. And they said that it was basically love at first sight and that they knew that he was their son and he was meant to be in their family. Now, they were told that Tenzin had actually been put into the foster care system at five months old because his mother had been arrested. Now, little did the Carter family know at that time that many, many lies surrounded the first few months of Tenzin's life, including his name. 
but they decided to go ahead and adopt Tenzin and they changed his name to William Stephen Tenzin Carter. Now eventually the family moved back to the States to raise their son and they landed in New Jersey. They were determined to give him the life he deserved and that's exactly what he got. Steve was growing up to be such an amazing child. He excelled at school. He had so many friends. He was always on his best behavior. He loved playing sports and hanging out with boys his own age and he didn't have any trouble adjusting to his adoptive family, which many adoptive kids can. Attachment can sometimes be a struggle for many foster children transferring into their adoptive family's home and this is simply because they haven't really ever had someone to fully attach themselves to because of being pushed from one family to another in the foster care system and this can lead to reactive attachment disorder which causes children to have a really hard time attaching to anyone or loving anyone including their adoptive family and it can cause a lot of trouble within the adoptive child and the adoptive family and lead to a lot of distraught feelings and behaviors that can be really hard to deal with, but Steve didn't really seem to deal with any of those. He bonded well with the Carters, and he was everything that they could have hoped for, and they were everything he could have hoped for. They treated him as every adoptive family should, like he was their son, like he was blood related to him, and like he had come from their own genetics. The whole family did have some doubts about who Steve was though, and this was because his biological mother had said that his biological father was a Hawaiian native. And yet, if you looked at Steve, you did not see that at all. He was very fair, he had bright blue eyes, blonde hair, like bleach blonde hair naturally. And although that that's possible, especially if his biological mother was white, it just seemed a little strange that he didn't have any ounce of that Hawaiian look to him. From a young age, Steve began to question more and more who he really was and who he really came from. The Carters didn't hide his adoption from him at all. He knew he was adopted from a young age, but he even though he loved his adoptive family, he still wanted to learn more about the people who created him. Especially because this whole origin story was shrouded in mystery from the very beginning, and this was the fact that his own birth certificate said he was actually born a year after he would have been born. And they figured this out and quickly realized it was made a year after he had already been living, which didn't make any sense. Steve's family had told him they didn't know why this was, and so Steve had grown up with so many questions, but no idea where to get the answers. And he went on with his life, but he was always curious about his past. The Carters were extremely worried as well. Pat and Steve Sr. were always in fear that somebody was going to come forward and take their son away from them. That they would pop up and say they were Steve's biological mother or father and suddenly want their son back. And they would no longer be able to have their adopted son or know who he was or be involved in his life anymore. However, after the first few years when this didn't happen, their anxiety began to pass and they still celebrated his adoption through a day called Came to Be Our Boy Day. And so every year on September 23rd, Steve was basically the center of attention and it was like a second birthday for him. And he got to be celebrated for coming into their family. And it was just a way to celebrate him being a part of their family, but also still respecting his own true identity for his biological family as well. After their fear of their boy being taken kind of subsided, the Carters decided to put Steve in contact with a network of people who could basically connect birth family with adoptive children. And the parents were able, the birth parents were able to send messages to their children if they wanted to, to get in contact, to possibly meet. And so for a really long time, Steve was working through this network and trying to see if his birth family came forward. However, they never did. He didn't get any messages. And so when he turned 18, he was actually given the option on whether to continue with this network or not, and he decided he didn't want to anymore. He was a grown adult by this point, and he had gotten married, he had a great job, but he was having trouble with the thought of having his own kids and not being able to even know who he was or what happened to him as a kid himself. And that is when his wife Tracy decided to get him a DNA testing kit for Christmas one year. 
And this was the first step that would spiral into many layers of uncovering this mystery. You see, this test didn't say that he was Hawaiian at all. It actually said that he was Scandinavian. And for the first time, Steve's looks made sense because many Scandinavian people are very fair with bright blue eyes and blonde hair. And he looked exactly like them. But if he wasn't Hawaiian, then why did his biological mother lie about his father? And why did she lie about everything else too? By the time Steve was 34 years old, he had all but given up on hope of finding any answers. Yet he was still intrigued nonetheless. And that is when he was scrolling his iPad one day and he came upon this article about a woman named Nettie Nancy. And this woman had discovered a huge secret about her birth family after many, many years of not knowing what was happening. And of course, this intrigued Steve, and he kept reading. You see, when Nettie was 18 years old, she had become pregnant for the first time, and in order to get health insurance to be able to take care of herself and this baby, she needed her birth certificate. So she went to the offices with her birth certificate in hand, only to be told that it was forged. She was then told if she continued to assume this fake identity, she would be arrested. She told them to keep the birth certificate that she didn't want it, that she didn't know it was forged. And that is when she went home to tell her mother what happened. And in a strange turn of events, her mother was furious with her, telling her that she was going to handle it all and that Nettie shouldn't have done it herself. Shortly after, the Department of Children and Families contacted Nettie's mother saying that if proper documentation was not shown, Nettie would need to become a ward of the state since she didn't have any of this proper documents. A few days later, Nettie's mother came to her crying saying that Nettie was adopted that Nettie's mother had left her and never came back, that she was a drug addict and she abandoned Nettie and her mother, her adoptive mother, brought her in. Nettie now knew that her mother wasn't her mother and she'd always kind of speculated this because she didn't look anything like her mother or anyone in her family. But her mother then refused to tell Nettie anything more. While Steve was reading about all of this, he learned that Nettie had become even more suspicious that there was more to this story. So she began to look through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And that's when Nettie found a picture of a missing baby that not only looked like her as a child, but looked like her daughter that she had just given birth to. It turned out Nettie had been kidnapped 19 days after birth from the Harlem Hospital. Her real name, was Carlina White. Anne Petaway had taken her after pretending to be a nurse. Now, she had pretended to her family that she had been pregnant beforehand, so they didn't think it was strange when she came home with this newborn. Nettie said that she never saw a resemblance between her and Anne, and she also always had a gut feeling. But when she contacted the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and told them she believed that she was Carlina, she also had something to prove that because on this article it said that this baby had a birthmark and in the exact same spot, Nettie had a birthmark there too. By 2011, DNA had proved that Nettie was in fact Carlina White and she had been kidnapped at birth. All of her questions about her past and her true identity were finally answered and that's when Steve decided that if this could happen for Carlina, it could happen for him too. He then began to scour the missingkids.org website that Nettie had used herself and began to scroll looking for a missing baby that matched him. Um, I actually have to thank CNN for that. Uh, I was on a lunch break hmm. and uh, one of your popping news uh, breakthroughs came through and it was the Carlita White story. She had found herself uh, on the Missing Kids website. So I had a couple free minutes at lunch and went on missingkids.com pulled up Hawaii 34 years male, and lo and behold, that was the picture that came up. After pages and pages of hopeful scrolling and trying to find the dates that matched, he found this picture that was like looking in a mirror. This person was said to be born one day away from his birthday. And the age progressed photo of this baby looked just like him. I thought minus the mullet, it was pretty much spot on on what I look like. How did you react to that? Uh, it was a bit shocking, uh, I have to tell you. Uh, 
to see yourself um, and to realize that, you know what, people have been looking for you for that long, uh, I was shell-shocked. Uh, at the same time, it was really the first time I've, I'd ever seen a baby picture of myself. So to see that along with a picture of what Mark's Panama would look like at 28 was pretty amazing. And when you realized that this was you, what did you, what did you do? Uh, the first thing I did was I copied the picture, sent it out to a couple friends, asked my friends, you know, who does this person look like? Does it look like me? Um, it was almost, you're in uh, a weird state at the time. Uh, a friend said it did kind of look like me. I eventually called my parents, um, sent them the picture as well. This boy who had disappeared was named Marks Panama Moriarty Barnes, and it looked identical to Steve. The picture even had his signature smirk. He immediately got chills and knew it was him, but was this really him or did he just so desperately want it to be? Well, the senior forensic imaging specialist for the website named Joe Mullins said that everything about your face is basically etched into your skull and that an age progression is an image based on the hope that the right person will see it and the children are basically put back where they belong. Uh, you know, I found the picture, I sent it to my parents via email, and then again, you know, I had to walk my parents into how to open email. So when they opened it, they saw it, saw the picture, and then realized that it looked like me, and then asked me to, you know, really think about what I wanted to do here, um, that, you know, it was my decision on how to move forward, uh, to talk to my soon-to-be wife then, and, and figure out a plan. And, you know, at the time, I didn't really have children, and it was funny, everybody I talked to, uh, had totally different separate views. Uh, people with children uh, were immediately telling me to call the police. You know, you've been missing. I don't care how long it's been. You have to let them know you've been found. And then people who didn't have kids were like, wow, that's a crazy story. So, you know, my mom said, you know, just keep it quiet, think about what you want to do, and then follow through. And then later that night, I talked to my uh, wife and we, uh, we, we figured out it would probably be a good idea to call the police. So, called the Honolulu Police Department, and then I called my parents to let them know that, you know, I'd called the police department, at which point they told me that they had already called the police department for me and sent over all my paperwork. So, uh, you know, kind of beat me to the punch. So with this, Steve decided to contact, after a little while of sending it to his friends and his family, the Honolulu Police Department, and he told them that he believed he was a missing person. They immediately asked for his information and began investigating to see if it really was. When Steve was asked to do a DNA test, he was more than willing. However, the results wouldn't come so easily. Eight long months of not knowing was really hard on Steve. That's all he thought about. It consumed him and he just wanted to know if it was him or not. But finally, the results were in and they showed that Steve Carter was Mark's Panama Moriarty Barnes and he had been missing for 34 years. Steve said that he felt shock but also amazement. He said, you grow up with a story in your head that a family member thought I would have a better life if I was with somebody else and so it's kind of that loss and regret that you didn't have that connection but then to find out that wasn't the case, it was totally something different, is a big pill to swallow. But his adoptive parents heard about this and then they began to feel guilty that they possibly had stolen somebody else's child. This news was already a lot for Steve to take in and his wife Tracy was actually the one to nudge him to keep going, to keep finding out more information. And so that's exactly what Steve would do, but he couldn't have imagined all that he would find. Was his case like Carlina White? Had he been kidnapped at birth too? Well, it turned out that his own biological father was actually the one who reported him missing all those years ago. His name was Mark Barnes, and at the time he lived in Hawaii, but he was not of Hawaiian descent. Mark was a veteran who became a journalist and had a 29-year-old girlfriend named Charlotte Moriarty. The two of them had a son who was six months old who was born on June 21st, 1977. Mark said that one day, Charlotte said that she was going to take Mark's, who was their baby, out on a walk and then to the grocery store. However, they never returned. But Mark didn't panic because he said that this was just like Charlotte. She was a very free spirit. She would often leave on flights to random destinations whenever she wanted to and come back a little while later. And so at first, Mark didn't panic. But as the weeks passed, he then decided to contact investigators to tell them what had happened. 
Now, the search began for Charlotte and baby Marks, and the stroller that she had taken was, was also found down their street at a bus stop. Mark spent the next year and a half of his life driving around the island trying to find any sign of either of them and was coming up empty-handed. But little did he know that his son was in an orphanage just 30 miles away from their home. But he had a different name. Neither Charlotte or Mark's had ever been found until now. You see, it was later found that Charlotte had broken into a home on the other side of the island and the owner called the police saying that she had a woman and baby in her home and when investigators arrived, Charlotte told them that her name was Jane Amy and that her son was Tin's enemy. She also faked his date of birth. Charlotte was then taken to a psychiatric facility while Marx was taken into the care system. It was speculated that Charlotte had severe mental health issues, but she was taken into this facility and she left a few days later against the judgment of the doctors who told her that she could stay but couldn't do anything when she wanted to leave. No one knew what happened to her, but thankfully we now know what happened to Marks and he survived. And now Steve knew exactly what happened to him all those years ago, or at least a little more than he knew before. And this was all thanks to another biological family member. You see, Steve had a half-sister named Jennifer who was eight years older than him. His mother had Jennifer with another man and then left her with that other man when she got pregnant with Marks. And so when Jennifer heard that her mother and her half-brother went missing, at first she believed they were both deceased for a really long time. But even though she believed that, she continued to scan crowds for them everywhere she would go. She wanted to find them. And years later, she decided she was going to find her half-brother. She thought he was still alive. And she actually was the one to convince police to create an age progression photo of him and put it online. And that is how Steve was able to find that he was missing. The whole reason that this was kind of made uh, forefront was there was a push in, I think, either 95, I think she, 2005 by President Bush to find missing children and mine was one of the top cases. So they had made a, a you know, a big push to find me and, you know, as soon as I had located myself and went through the DNA testing, uh, they put me in contact not only with my half-sister but also with uh, my biological father. Steve decided to call his birth family. He wanted to basically test the waters before meeting them, and he was really nervous. I mean, like gut-wrenching, did not want to do this at first. But his birth father, Mark, picked up the phone and was basically speechless. All he could say was, wow, oh wow, oh wow. He said that he always wondered what happened to his son, and he had since had two daughters, but it didn't ever stop him from worrying about Mark's. Uh, there were a lot of awkward pauses, as well there probably should be. Um, it, it was a it was a big announcement for both. It was a it's a life changing event, I'd say. Um, well, you know, we we talked about me growing up, what I do now, what he did. Uh, it was it was very eye opening. His father, Mark, said that he was absolutely positively thunderstruck and amazed when Steve called him. She, he didn't believe that that would even be something that was possible after 34 years. Steve also decided to contact his half-sister Jennifer over Twitter before eventually calling her and Jennifer said that over that phone call she really wanted to just reach through the phone and hug him. Steve says that he does want to take it really slow though with integrating, you know, meeting them and becoming a part of their family again and that the truth was most important for him and that is super important that he got it that he realizes that he's a missing child and or that he was a missing child and now he knows about his past and now there's a lot more people that he didn't know existed that are biological family that want to be part of his life and it's a bit overwhelming for him but I mean that is expected to be overwhelming you you can't just all of a sudden realize you have this whole other family and not be overwhelmed he has since learned that he was actually named after Karl Marx and his godfather, his nickname was Panama. Now, as of 2012, Steve still hadn't met his biological family in person, and this is just because he says it's really hard to digest, and that he got a happy ending, which is usually not what happens in this sort of scenario, so he's really happy for that. 
He also still goes by Steve Carter because that is the name that he has gone by his whole life. But the whole family believes that this reunion would not have been possible without the age progression photo and they urge other families of missing people to force law enforcement to use their resources and to come out with age progression and to post it online where it can reach millions of people. Joe Mullins says that age progression photos do work and it can provide answers. And so it is highly encouraged for people who feel that something is off, maybe check these websites because you could have been a missing child. Who knows? And you could have a happy ending like Steve. You know, I, I was raised in uh, an amazing home, amazing family, uh, grew up with amazing friends, and now have been able to reconnect with my biological family. And more than that, uh, you know, in the United States, we have the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they're the ones who actually produced that age progression photo. And it's only because of that that I was actually able to connect the dots. And without their work and their help, none of this would have been possible. And Steve's adoptive family have since gotten really used to the idea of Steve having his biological family in his life. They urge him to be a part of their family. They say it's completely fine. He can have two families and they think that it's going to be wonderful for him. However, Steve's biological mother is still missing today. I mean, Charlotte Marcella Moriarty has not been seen since 1977. She would be 75 today. She's a white female with brown hair, blue eyes, standing at 5'6", and weighing around 130 to 140. She has a scar on her chin and her leg. She has pierced ears and a chipped upper left incisor. She could possibly be wearing a turquoise wedding band as well. So if you know anything, please call the Honolulu Police Department at 808-529-3060. For. Do you think that Charlotte just ran away? Do you think she didn't want to be a part of this life where she was a mother and a wife? Or do you think that her mental health issues or the possible ones she had had something to do with it and possibly ended her life? I don't know. It, it really worries me that possibly she could have gotten into some trouble and, you know, her mental health went downhill and then that's why nobody was able to find her after that. A lot of me really hopes that Steve gets to connect with his biological mother, that she's okay, that she got the help she needed, and that she's, you know, in her old age but still alive today. And so I do hope that he gets the answers he deserves, all of them. Because after going so many years wondering, he deserves to be told the whole truth not just pieces of it. And so I thought this was a really nice survival story of a man who didn't even know he was missing or possibly involved in some sort of crazy thing that happened when he was a child and then learned about it 34 years later. Can you imagine? Just imagine your whole life being uprooted and changed because, not because you weren't aware, but because you had this gut feeling, you followed it, and now you got answers you weren't prepared for because who can be prepared for something like that but Steve has actually done a lot of interviews and stuff and you've seen them throughout this video and so I just think it's really cool that he's willing to talk about his story and I'm happy that I could share it with all of you also don't forget to click the link in the description if you want to play small town murders which I really do encourage you to do don't ever forget to speak up your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces okay bye